Hello, and welcome to Construction Grammar and its application to English. This is a series of videos that accompanies the book that you see here. The book is an introduction to the linguistic theory that's called Construction Grammar. And um, in this video, I will go over the contents of Chapter 1, the introduction. If you already have the book, that's great, of course, but if you don't have the book, uh, no need to worry. You will be able to follow the ideas that I discuss here. So let's get to work. Um, what is construction grammar? Construction grammar is a theory of linguistic knowledge. It's a theory of what speakers know when they know a language. Now, what is it that speakers know when they know a language? If you want to, you can do a little exercise, pause the video here, and get out a piece of paper and make a list of the things that you think speakers ought to know when they know a language. Want to do that? All right, now's your chance. Uh, I will continue now. So it turns out that speakers have to know quite a few things. They have to know words, uh, they have to know what words like dog and submarine, what they mean, how they are pronounced. Uh, speakers also have to know that there are different kinds of words so that they know that red and tasty represent one kind of word and lobster and uh, cloud and cable, those represent different a different kind of word. One thing that definitely made it onto your list, I guess, is that speakers know how to put words together to form phrases and sentences. So speakers know that red can be combined with ball in phrases like the red ball. Um, speakers also know which words don't work together and speakers know that some um, strings of words are proper sentences of English, whereas others aren't. So, saw John Mary, that's not a sentence, that's word soup. Speakers are also able to uh, put right endings on words. So, think of the word walk. It occurs in different shapes, in different contexts. Uh, we have walks, walked, walking. And speakers know where to put which. Yeah, so they know that. Then, speakers are also able to understand newly coined words, creative uh, coinages. So even if you've never heard the word festiveness before, you can figure out what that means. You know what that means. Speakers also know that sometimes more is meant than what is said. If you uh, read through the economy section of your newspaper and you read that General Motors were able to increase production in the second quarter, what this means is that, well, they actually did increase production. Uh, it's not that they were able to, and then they thought, ah, it would be better for the environment if we cut down production a little bit. No, it doesn't happen. A last and uh, seemingly unimportant point is that speakers must know idiomatic expressions, such as, I'm all ears, let's take a break, we really hit it off, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so all of this is stuff that speakers have to know, and... Uh, Linguistic theories are concerned with the question how all of this knowledge is represented in the human mind. How is all of this um, implemented in your brain? That's what we want to know. Okay, now if you were given the task to attack this problem and maybe to reverse engineer a speaker, uh, let's say um, you're approached by a software company and they say, well, please write us a computer program that can talk. You would likely follow a route uh, that has actually been taken in the linguistic tradition. Namely, you would compartmentalize the problem. You would build modules of linguistic knowledge. So if you were to write a computer program like that, you would probably divide it up into different components. So you would get your four smartest engineer friends together and you would say, okay, Barbara, write me a list containing all the words and idioms. That would be the lexicon. Um, George, <clears throat> you write me a list of syntactic phrase structure rules. That will be the grammar component. Um, Jenny, we need a procedure that links the nominal phrases of a sentence uh, to semantic roles such as agent, patient, experiencer, and so on and so forth. And lastly, um, William, you've always been good with sounds, you have a pleasant voice. Uh, 
come up with a procedure that transforms representations of sounds into actual sounds. And so you would uh, divide and conquer the problem. Okay. Um, in the following, I would like to refer to this approach uh, as the dictionary and grammar model, because what's at the heart of this is that linguistic knowledge consists of a mental lexicon that has all the words and some kind of grammar component that has the combinatorics, yeah, the syntax. <clears throat> um, I haven't come up with this word, uh, the dictionary and grammar model. It's rather John Taylor, uh, in his recent book, The Mental Corpus, uses this term, and I find it really, really useful. So that's the dictionary and grammar model. Um, this model has been very successful, but construction grammar is very much opposed to this dictionary and grammar view. If you ask a construction grammarian, okay, could you make a list of the things that speakers have to know when they know a language? They would come up with a list, but one that is much, much shorter than what we've seen earlier. What they would say is that, well, here's our list. It has only one item. What speakers have to know from the perspective of construction grammar is that they must know constructions. Whoa, wait a minute. No, I'm not making this up. Um, here are two quotes from Adele Goldberg, one of the leading researchers in construction grammar. And uh, she says that the totality of our knowledge of language is captured by a network of constructions, a constructicon. And um, no, that, that could have been a fluke. So let's look at a second uh, quote. The network of constructions captures our grammatical knowledge of language in total, uh, that is, its constructions all the way down. Right, so construction grammarians are quite explicit on this. All that speakers know is constructions, nothing else. Wow, I'll let that sink in for a second. Um, what would motivate a claim that departs so radically from what we've seen earlier? Well, it turns out that the crucial bit here is the point about idioms, yeah, the last point on our initial list. Seemingly, you know, okay, that's something that you do at the very end when you're done with everything else, with all the important stuff, then you deal with idioms. Turns out idioms are really, really important. Why are they important? Well, first of all, <clears throat> it's not the case that idioms are sort of a marginal thing. Idiomatic expressions are everywhere, and to illustrate that, I brought you a little text here. Um, in winter, you can look out of the window and tell it's two degrees Celsius outside. How? Because the crocuses are coming into bloom. Crocuses are plants that nature has provided with a biological thermometer. It's very accurate, reacting to temperature differences of as little as 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. As the weather gets warmer, the flowers open, but when the temperature drops, they close again. Right. Can you see an idiom in this text? Is there anywhere, anywhere raining cats and dogs? Someone biting the dust? No, not really. Um, so what's idiomatic about this? Well, let me show you a few things. Um, let's start with the first two words, in winter. In winter, the sequence of the preposition in and the bare nominal winter uh, means something special, namely in winter, generally speaking, or during winter time, usually. <clears throat> um, this is something that speakers know. Speakers know that you don't start a sentence like this saying, uh, in the winter. A second language learner of English um, would be puzzled by this. You know, why not say in the winter? Um, what's wrong with that? Well, native speakers know there's something wrong with in the winter. Um, Another example, um, you can look out of the window and tell it's two degrees Celsius outside. Um, in the dictionary and grammar model, the meaning of tell would come from the lexicon and it would say, well, tell, that means to communicate the contents of, say, a story or a joke. You can tell a story, you can tell a joke, uh, but that's not what is meant here. Yeah, you, you can look out of the window and tell it's two degrees outside. That's not somebody standing at the window and saying, it's two degrees outside. No, it's um, you can discern, you can know 
that it's two degrees outside. And this is a consequence of tell being in the company of the modal auxiliary can. If you can tell something, that means you can know something, you can discern something. That's something that native speakers uh, know, yeah, they're familiar with that, but that's something that a second language learner uh, would be hard pressed to do just you know having access to what words mean and what uh, how words can be put together okay this is perhaps the most obvious uh, example of an idiom here the crocuses are coming into bloom coming into bloom um, I did a little research on this uh, flowers can come into bloom they can come into leaf they can come into fruit and uh, what's kind of striking about this is that usually there's more than one thing involved. Yeah, So there are many flowers, not just one flower. Uh, if flowers are coming into leaf, um, there's many leaves. Yeah, And coming into fruit, many apples or oranges or plums or whatever. Uh, yet the word is in the singular. Um, and notice also that you can come into bloom but you can't come out of bloom. There are restrictions on how you can use this. Native speakers know that. Um, as a second language learner, you can probably understand come into bloom. Yeah, that sort of makes sense. But uh, there's no way of knowing in advance that this is how you say it. Uh, one last example here, differences of as little as 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. Um, as, adjective as, that's an idiom that you probably uh, encounter in second language learning. But here it means something more specialized. Uh, differences of as little as 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. There, the idea that is conveyed is um, these differences are remarkably little. Okay, so differences of as little as 0 0.5 degrees. There's something remarkable about the fact that these crocuses are so fine-tuned uh, with regard to their temperature detection system. Right, um, so even in a text like this that doesn't look like much from reading it once, there are tons and tons and tons of idiomatic expressions in there. A second observation. Um, idiomatic expressions are more than fixed strings. If idioms were fixed strings, like it's raining cats and dogs, another one bites the dust, uh, six feet under, uh, we really hit it off, then it would not be so hard to represent that in the dictionary. Yeah, You could just have a large idiom appendix to the dictionary and say, well, that's stuff that speakers memorize. However, it turns out that idiomatic expressions are more variable than that. They have slots in which you can insert uh, things. Um, so there are more than fixed strings. And I brought you another little text that illustrates this. Um, this is about pets and about pet sitters. Um, clients tell me that they are not worried about their property as long as their pets are all right, says William Lewis, Managing Director of Home and Pet Care. We often get asked to look after elderly pets whose owners are worried that going into kennels may be too big a shock. Most sitters are over 60, sensible, and probably have pets on their own. So what's going on here is that people go on holiday and uh, some old guy acts as the pet and home sitter. Right, so what's idiomatic about this and where are the idioms that are more than fixed strings? Well, take this one here. Uh, going into kennels may be too big a shock. This is a general pattern. Um, so something can be too big a shock. Um, you could say that's too expensive a watch for me to get. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so you see that you can both replace the adjective, big, and you can replace the noun, shock. Mm. And you can also fiddle with the two. You can say, well, how big an area are we talking about? Um, all right. So, um, this means that speakers can't just be memorizing too big a shock or how big an area as a fixed string, but rather they have to memorize some kind of schema 
that has information. Okay, you can put adjectives in there, you can put nouns in there, and they have to be in a certain sequence. Um, that is more complicated. Um, is that possible to to have that be in the dictionary? Or I mean, it, it starts to look something. It starts to look like something that really should be part of the grammar. Uh, but then again, well, it, it's not really a common syntactic phrase, so it's probably not part of the set of phrase structure rules that students are presented with in an introductory linguistics class. One more example here. Um, most sitters are over 60 and probably have pets of their own. Also, this is an idiom. Um, to have pets of their own, meaning they are pet owners themselves. Um, and you see that this can be modified. You can change the noun. Uh, they have motorcycles of their own. They have homes of their own. Um, it can occur in the singular or the plural. You can say John now has a car of his own. And uh, so also this of one's own construction, we might call it, that has uh, open slots that can be modified. A third observation, idiomatic expressions are productive. This relates to the point that I've just shown you. I want to show you one famous construction, the comparative correlative construction, that's also sometimes called the Xer, the wire. Um, so exemplified by things like the bigger they come, the harder they fall, the bigger the company, the worse the service, the bigger the company, the worse is the service, the bigger the company is, the worse the service is, the more the better, the more I get, the better. What you see here in these examples is that, um, well, in each case you have um, these um, words, the, then an adjective in the comparative, the bigger, and then some kind of phrase, and that phrase can vary, okay? It can be uh, a, a sentence, like they come. It can be a noun phrase, like the company. It can be nothing, as in the more, the better. So there is syntactic variation. Uh, there's productivity in this idiomatic expression. Okay, so... Um, where does this leave the grammar, the dictionary and grammar model? Well, it indicates that there is quite a few things going on between the dictionary and the grammar. So some expressions that look like they belong into the dictionary, but then again, there's flexibility in there, there's grammatical sensitivity in there that would make them look more like they belong to the grammar component. So, <clears throat> well, it renders the distinction of words on the one hand and phrases on the other less clear-cut. <clears throat> um, and this has led uh, construction grammarians to say, well, this distinction, we need to abandon it. We need to do something that accounts for all of these many idiomatic expressions in a way that is better than just saying, okay, we'll deal with them in some kind of appendix to the dictionary. Here's a phrase, a uh, quotation from Fillmore and colleagues, uh, 1988. And what they say is that it appears to us that the machinery needed for describing the so-called minor or peripheral constructions, the, the X of the wire, the pets of one's own, uh, the so big a shock, uh, these constructions, uh, which has occupied us here. Um, so the machinery for them will have to be powerful enough to be generalized to more familiar structures, in particular those represented by individual phrase structure rules. In other words, the descriptive apparatus that you need for the X or the wire, the of one's own construction, and so on and so forth, that needs to be powerful um, in a way that would allow you to also deal with things like noun phrases and verb phrases. So, um, then, uh, if it's the case that idiomatic expressions are all over the place, if it's the case that these idiomatic expressions are more than fixed strings, and if it's the case that idiomatic expressions are highly productive, then 
the appendix to the grammar, yeah, the component that deals with these idioms, can in fact be extended to deal with all patterns that exist in a given language. The machinery that's necessary to account for the periphery of grammar is by necessity powerful enough to account for the core, yeah, the core being noun phrases, prepositional phrases, and so on and so forth. Um, so instead of a dictionary plus grammar model, you have a unified model, and that's the constructicon. Right. Um, now, a little parenthesis here. Um, many researchers in construction grammar share a fascination for patterns that are deviant, unruly, and unpredictable. So construction grammarians delight in constructions that you could call peripheral, marginal. Uh, things like him a lawyer, question mark. Uh, it's amazing the lies he told her. One step closer and I'll shoot or uh, come to your senses, have you? Okay. These are not the kind of sentence that you would be able to diagram with a simple phrase structure rule. And you see that there are fancy, pragmatic um, characteristics at work here. It's amazing, the lies he told her. Yeah, that's not... No, that, okay, there's one copula in there, but... Um, <clears throat> Not a typical sentence of English. So, the closer one looks, uh, the more you start looking for construction, the more it becomes apparent that really all grammatical patterns are riddled with exceptions and idiosyncrasies. And so, construction grammarians become more and more pessimistic that you can actually accomplish something like the dictionary and grammar model and capture a significant part of what's going on in language. Right, but that only as a short uh, parenthesis here. Now, one thing that we definitely need to accomplish in this uh, first video here is to arrive at a definition of what a construction actually is. What is a construction? Um, <clears throat> As somebody interested in language, you probably have some notion of what a construction is. You have some idea. And in fact, in many structuralist and uh, pedagogical grammars, there is a sort of pre-theoretical notion that a construction is a complex linguistic form. When you put things together and you have to learn how this is put together, that is a construction. Mm. Things like, for instance, the be going to construction or the past perfect. If you have to tell students, okay, this is the past perfect construction, that would be a construction in this sense. Now, notice that in construction grammar, the definition is wider than that. Uh, well, it's both wider and more narrow, but we'll get to the more narrow part. Uh, in construction grammar, a construction is a generalization that speakers make. It's a piece of linguistic knowledge, not just a form. So, speakers perceive similarities between a number of different linguistic forms that they encounter in usage. So they hear expressions such as dark as night, easy as pie, good as gold, cold as hell. And if you give speakers enough of these, then these similarities lead to the formation of a category, a generalization, um, such as, for instance, adjective as noun. If speakers generalize over all of these, dark as night, easy as pie, good as gold, uh, they arrive at a generalization, and that generalization then is a construction. I'll have more detailed definitions of construction uh, in just a second. So what I wanted to point out is that there is an overlap between traditional and pedagogical grammars and construction grammar in that these things like the be going to construction, the ditransitive construction, the passive construction, the past perfect construction, that is larger syntactic patterns that have to be learned, those are called constructions. But the important thing is traditional and pedagogical grammars talk about this and mean the form. Construction grammarians talk about this and mean the generalization that speakers have made. So the term construction and construction grammar is wider. <clears throat> Here's a definition from an important book uh, 
from the construction Vermeer uh, tradition. Here's Adele Goldberg's Constructions, a construction grammar approach to argument structure. And in this book, she offers this definition. I'll walk you through this. Uh, C is a construction if and only if, for the logicians among you. Um, C is a form meaning pair with a uh, form, that's F, and uh, the meaning is S, that's for semantics. Uh, so a, a pairing of form and meaning so that some aspect of the form or some aspect of the meaning is not strictly predictable from C's component parts or from other previously established constructions. Ooh. Um, so that, let's look at that again. So it's a form meaning pair. It's a symbol. Uh, so a connection between some kind of uh, form, say the sound uh, dog, and the idea of the dog, the meaning. Um, okay, and some aspect of the form or some aspect of the meaning should not be strictly predictable from the component parts. This is something that we need to talk about. This, um, I'll deal with this separately. Just to uh, rephrase it a little bit. Constructions are symbolic units. There's this criterion of being not strictly predictable uh, from the component parts. So if there's anything to the whole that cannot be figured out if the speaker knows the parts, then the whole is a construction. Uh, this is probably most um, clear for idioms like if I say, uh, John is far and away the best candidate, uh, then somebody who knows the meanings of the words far and away the best and candidate, they still wouldn't be able to figure out that what I'm saying is that he is um, the best candidate by a long, long distance. Um, so he is much better than anybody else. That's what I'm saying. And that is expressed by these words far and away. Yeah, that cannot be figured out if I know the meanings of far and away. Um, but non-predictability, that's also the case with lexical words such as dog and submarine. The sounds of dog and submarine don't allow you to predict what the words mean. And it's also evident in, in complex patterns such as the X or the wire. Um, the more you read, the less you understand. Um, it's not really clear from the words themselves what the whole thing means. So, um, what's the rationale behind this non-predictability as a definitional criterion of constructions? Well, if a pattern is completely regular and semantically compositional, then you don't need to remember it and it doesn't count as a construction. So if I say good to see you, you can understand me just by understanding the words good to see and you. Uh, gin and tonic, that is transparent. It's a beverage that contains gin and tonic. Brightness, yeah, that is the quality of being uh, bright and so on and so forth. So these things on that definition are not constructions. They're something else, namely constructs instantiations of constructions. I'll get to that. So let's talk about non-predictable meanings in some more detail. Uh, non-predictable meanings are very evident in uh, idiomatic expressions such as we're back to square one. Well, um, it's not really that we're going back to some kind of square. Uh, it's just that we have to start over again. Will and Jenny finally tied the knot. Um, well, they, they got married. Yeah. His theory is totally off the mark. Yeah, off the mark. That is an idiomatic expression. Or let's call it a day. Yeah, let's call it a day. Uh, you know what that means. Those are non-predictable meanings. But notice that um, the definition also talked about non-predictable aspects of form. And those perhaps are a little more tricky. Uh, non-predictable forms you see in these examples here, all of a sudden. Well, sudden, that's an adjective, um, sudden death, yeah, sudden developments. Um, all of a sudden, 
there sudden occurs with a indefinite determiner um, and uh, all of a sudden. That's a weird combination of word types if you think about it. Also by and large uh, we have a preposition by, a conjunction and, and then an adjective so you conjoin a preposition and an adjective. That's odd. <clears throat> That's nothing like apples and oranges uh, by and large. And the meaning of that of course is also non-compositional. Uh, the more the merrier. This also is a very odd beast, syntactically speaking. Um, the form that looks like the, the definite determiner. Historically, it's a very different thing. Um, so here we have a form that is very much idiosyncratic. Try as I might, I just couldn't grasp the principle. Well, try as I might, that is a very unusual syntactic um, string. How big an area are we talking about? That's again the too big a shock construction there. Or I have waited many a day for this to happen. What's unusual there is the quantifier many. Usually um, many occurs with words in the plural. Yeah, Many dogs, many apples, many computers, but not many a day with a singular noun with an indefinite determiner. Those are non-predictable forms. Those are forms that you wouldn't really expect to find given a simple set of phrase structure rules that you have in your grammar. Right, so all of these then are constructions, things that speakers have to learn in addition to all the words and all the syntactic phrase structure rules. Okay, I mentioned the form, uh, the term construct earlier on. Um, constructions, just to remind you, those are generalizations that speakers make that allow them to talk, and constructs are instantiations of those generalizations. And here I, uh, well, I invite you to make an analogy with cookie cutters and cookies. So here are two cookie cutters, uh, one that allows you to make Yoda cookies and there is another one I think uh, those are not clone warriors those are um, Boba Fett I want to say um, for the experts out there. Right so the cookie cutter that's the generalization that allows you to make lots and lots of cookies uh, or pronounce lots and lots of constructs and then the constructs those are the things that you make with the generalization the individual tokens. Okay, The analogy is imperfect, but still, maybe it's a little bit useful. Okay, constructions and constructs. Um, here are some constructs. Uh, John enjoys playing the piano. If you know how uh, the verb enjoy behaves syntactically, you can figure out what the sentence means. Uh, strawberries are more expensive than apples. I wonder why he keeps wearing that hat Harvey's taunting of the beer was merciless. All of these are syntactically well-behaved, semantically transparent. That's a construct. A construct instantiates a construction. So John enjoys playing the piano. We need to have some notion that there is a complement taking uh, construction where you have a verb like enjoy and then an in clause following that. But for this particular example, we don't need to know anything more specific than that. Right. Um, moving on, um, Adele Goldberg, a couple years later, offers a slightly modified uh, definition of what a construction is. Here it is. Uh, the first part is very much like the one that I've shown you earlier. Any linguistic pattern is recognized as a construction as long as some aspect of its form or function is not strictly predictable from its component parts or from other constructions recognized to exist. That's the non-predictable form, non-predictable function part. And then in bold, there's something new going on. In addition, patterns are stored as constructions even if they are fully predictable as long as they occur with sufficient frequency. So this means that those transparent parts, transparent constructs, may be remembered by speakers if they hear them 
often enough. Let's see, I think I have some examples there. Um, so this extends the earlier definition to include patterns that are fully regular and semantically compositional, that is transparent, as long as they are sufficiently frequent, and we'll have to talk about what that means. Um, what this boils down to is that there is what you could call redundant storage of transparent, that is regularly formed, uh, morphological forms, so walked, going cars. Think about it, if you know that there is something called the past tense rule, past tense inflection, you wouldn't have to memorize um, the form walked separately. But if you hear the form walked often enough, then probably you might just remember it redundantly. So even though you don't really have to, you remember it. Um, it also entails that there's redundant storage of compositional prefabs and collocations such as I don't know or gin tonic. <clears throat> and quite often you observe then that these collocations are somehow uh, reduced in production. So I don't know uh, tends to be very much reduced in speech. Here are some entrenched predictable constructions. So things that would now fall under the definition of constructions. I love you. Yeah, uh, people say that a lot. People remember that. Uh, I don't know. Take a seat. Can I ask you something? Or how's your day been? Uh, these are entrenched predictable constructions and what happens with these uh, things that are said often is that um, well, maybe their meanings are still fully transparent, but um, Something like how has your day been that becomes a conventional way of uh, behaving in conversation, so if You come home to your partner uh, at the end of a working day, you can say, well, how has your day been as an opener of the conversation? Compare this to the equally transparent, um, can I ask you how you would assess the quality of your day? Um, that is markedly different than how's your day been, even though the meanings are probably very similar. Right, now, Mm, you could wonder, should a construction grammar represent just non-predictable constructions or should it represent both non-predictable and entrenched constructions? And there are different answers that have been given to this in the uh, construction grammar literature. Here's a picture of Charles Fillmore, one of the main architects of construction grammar, and he would say that no, a construction grammar should be parsimonious we just want to represent everything that is non-predictable. <clears throat> Whereas on the right hand here, uh, Adele Goldberg says, no, no, no. Um, her new definition, her 2006 definition says, well, also represent entrenched construction, allow for redundant representation because the psycholinguistic evidence that we have suggests that there is a whole lot of redundant representation going on. Right. Um, of course, the non-predictable um, representation, the, the Fillmorean view, that makes a whole lot of sense if you want to implement a construction grammar in a computer program, because for a computer it's more uh, meaningful to, to do that. I'll come to that in just a second. Um, these two approaches, representing only that which is necessary or representing stuff redundantly, this has been discussed under the headings of complete inheritance on the one hand versus a full entry model on the other. So, um, if the description of grammar is approached from an engineering perspective, if you take a computational approach, then storage is relatively costly, whereas computation is cheap. Okay, Computers, they're good at figuring stuff out. Storing stuff, that's still quite costly. So what can be computed need not be stored. So if you can state a generalization, you should state that generalization and that makes redundant representations unnecessary. Um, so in this complete inheritance view of grammar, specific constructions inherit the complete descriptive content from the more general constructions that they instantiate. So an idiom such as kick the habit inherits information from the transitive kick construction 
which in turn inherits stuff from the transitive object construction, which in turn inherits stuff from the verb phrase construction. Yeah, you see how all of this more general information is passed down towards kick the habit, and so it needn't be represented separately at the level of kick the habit. That's the complete inheritance um, view, and I have a little quote here to illustrate that a bit further. This is Fillmore and colleagues speaking uh, on complete inheritance. Here's what they say. All of the many competing accounts of the working of language draw a distinction in one way or another between what it is that speakers know outright about their language and what it is that they have to be able to figure out. For example, speakers of English have to know what red means and that it is an adjective, and they have to know what ball means and that it is a noun. They have to know that adjectives can co-occur with nouns in a modification structure, as in a phrase like red ball, and they have to know the proper strategies for giving a semantic interpretation to such adjective-noun combinations. But, here's the important part, they, have, they do not have to know separately or be told what the phrase red ball means. That is something which what they already know enables them to figure out. All right, so on the complete inheritance view, what you can figure out on the basis of what you already know, you don't need to represent separately. No redundant representations. Um, now, I already talked about the motivation of the full entry model. If the description of grammar is approached from a usage-based perspective that starts with the human processor, then computation is relatively costly. Yeah? People are bad at figuring stuff out. That's where mistakes happen. Uh, but storage is cheap, so human beings are quite good at remembering stuff. Um, so on this view, redundant representations are ubiquitous. There's lots and lots of them. And if a generalization can be stated, that does not mean that speakers actually made that generalization. Okay, so on this view, there's lots and lots of information at low level, at a low level of uh, grammatical representation. Um, so in the full entry model, specific constructions restate information that is contained in more abstract constructions. And if and how people associate information with these more abstract constructions, that's very much an empirical question. So uh, bottom line, even fully compositional and rule abiding patterns are stored. I come to the last part of this video. Uh, how can you tell whether a linguistic form is a construction. So in this part, we'll go over some detection strategies. Yeah? How do you detect whether or not something is a construction? Um, first strategy here, I have four of them. Um, the first strategy, does your construction, well, if you encounter a string of words, does that string of words have characteristics that deviate from canonical patterns? So here again, a few examples. I have waited many a day for this to happen, many uh, deviates in its syntactic behavior here from ordinary many, which occurs with a plural noun. Uh, a six-year-old child, think about it, um, six, the quantifier six usually would call for a plural noun, but here we have a six-year-old child, and you see that this is productive. You can have a three-foot uh, tall toddler, um, a six-inch long nail, and so on a nine inch long nail. Um, if he gets here earlier, all the better. Yeah, so there we have the and better in an unusual syntactic configuration. I kid you not. Unusual syntax. Uh, into the room walked Noam Chomsky. That's uh, a construction that's known as locative inversion. Or I am bitter enemies with John. Um, so here, I am, that usually calls for something in the singular, but then something plural occurs. I am bitter enemies with John. Yeah, odd. So if there is some grammatical oddity, you're probably dealing with a construction. Second strategy, is the meaning non-compositional? Does the whole mean more than the combination of the parts? 
so this could be argued for greeting formulas like how are you doing yeah that does not represent a literal request for the quality in which somebody is doing whatsoever uh, but rather it's yeah I am here I know you I extend my best wishes to you I am performing some sort of social grooming that is expected of us that's what it does and that's non-compositional during the game he broke a finger what's non-compositional about this is that well he did not break any old finger it was a finger from his own hand um, and also this best friends construction so we've been best friends since high school um, best friends with one another now you can contrast this with we have been um, vegetarians since high school it means that each of us has been vegetarian on their own uh, but here best friends means we've been best friends of one another um, in connection with this principle of non-compositional meaning I want to introduce a term namely coercion we'll talk about this in later videos uh, coercion that is uh, defined in such a way that if the lexical item is semantically incompatible with its morphosyntactic context if it occurs in an odd syntactic context then the meaning of the lexical item conforms to the meaning of the structure in which it is embedded in other words the syntactic context squishes the meaning of the word into the direction that it enforces Think of examples such as three beers, please. Yeah, uh, beer, that usually is a mass noun. It doesn't take the plural suffix by its own. But in a construction such as three, which calls for a countable noun, three beers, please. Or John sauced the pizza. Yeah, sauce, that usually is a noun, but here it acts as a verb uh, because it occurs in a position where a verb usually is and it takes verbal inflection and what it means is that well John did something with sauce and a pizza was involved so you can figure out it's you know John put sauce on top of a pizza and then he baked it Frank played the piano to pieces uh, well we'll talk about more about this example in later videos but you can figure out that something odd is going on with play here strategy number three does the construction have constraints that are idiosyncratic? Now, this is a little bit more difficult to figure out, uh, in particular when you're a second language learner, because it requires you to play around with uh, these examples and uh, stumble across examples that don't work or don't work as well. Think of an example such as Mary is a smarter lawyer than John. You can say that. That's a fine sentence of English. What you can't do is Mary is the smarter lawyer than John. Now, why is that? Um, we're talking about Mary, so somebody who's known. Why not use the definite article? Mary is the smarter lawyer than John. Um, oh, odd. Um, that's an idiosyncratic constraint. That's nothing that I could explain straight away. Um, that's something that you would have to look into and hopefully explain later on. Um, the is it just me construction? Is it just me or is it hot in here? Mm, you can't just say is it just you or is it hot in here? Or is it just him or is it hot in here? Um, you could probably do that but notice that it's not as successful, not as conventional as is it just me or is it just us? The dog over there is asleep. Fine sentence of English. Over there is the asleep dog. Word soup. Yeah, why is that? Um, or take morphological word formation processes. Um, you can prefix adjectives with un, unconscious, unaware, uncool. And uh, you can do that with some adjectives, but not with others. So ungreen, that's a terrible word of English. That's not a word. Um, and you could think of situations where it makes sense to use the word ungreen. So you've had this carpet of yours it's a green carpet and you've had it for ages and uh, you're sick and tired of it you want something else you don't care what color it is as long as it's not green so you enter the carpet shop and say I need something ungreen please and the job assistant will look at you and say well that's not a word 
you have to settle for something that's red or blue or gray or well you get my point um last example here i brought john a glass of water that's fine it's the ditransitive construction i brought the table a glass of water is decidedly odd um same syntax and you can probably figure out what the speaker would have wanted to say but nonetheless it doesn't work it just doesn't work something some constraint is at work and that constraint is something that you need to figure out it's idiosyncratic strategy four does a construction have collocational preferences so there's this idiom uh, you drive me crazy and uh, you can use crazy but you can also use a set of other um, related words like that drives me insane that drives me nuts that drives me bananas that drives me up the wall and so on and so forth but let's say it's restricted um, so you can drive somebody bananas but you can't drive somebody cucumbers um, perhaps less visible but nonetheless real are collocational preferences with more general constructions for instance modal auxiliary constructions take the slightly old-fashioned auxiliary shall you could say things like i shall return to this in chapter four i shall discuss quantum theory in chapter five i shall argue for a constructional account of quantum theory in chapter six um, that is very idiomatic fine uh, i shall call you after lunch sounds a little bit stilted uh, and that's something that speakers know that they react to so it probably forms part of the knowledge that we as linguists should be able to model um, second example Einstein was the first to fully understand relativity that's I don't know if that's true but that's an example of the split infinitive construction and it's fine with the words fully and understand it's not so fine with uh, adequately and describe so Einstein was the first to adequately describe relativity sounds a little um, okay I'm done soon um, so you would need corpus evidence or psycholinguist evidence uh, for this strategy summing up um, what do speakers know when they know a language well in the dictionary and grammar model they have a large lexicon with words and some set of grammatical rules contrasting with that in construction grammar you have a large hierarchically structured inventory of constructions a constructicon in the third video of this series I'll talk more in more detail about the constructicon constructions we've established are linguistic generalizations non-predictable forms paired with non-predictable meanings or a high enough frequency how can you identify constructions well you can identify constructions if uh, you have a form that deviates from more canonical patterns that shows non-compositional meanings that has idiosyncratic constraints or collocational preferences. I want to finish with just a brief preview of chapter two. The next video will be about argument structure constructions um, for a reason, namely that uh, one centerpiece uh, reference in construction grammar is Adele Goldberg's 1995 book on argument structure constructions where she analyzes simple sentences such as John gave Mary a book or John hammered the metal flat they don't look very idiomatic you might think what's so special about them well why are simple sentences so important for construction grammar that's something that we'll deal with in the next video in chapter two and i hope you um, are interested enough to go online and watch it all right i'll see you then